Hi everyone, my name is Patrick Akil, and for today's episode, I have a first in Beyond Coding History because I had three guests on. They're all software engineers over at Bolt.com and really excited about the Go programming language, which is exactly what we covered this episode. Hannes de Jager, Goos van den Bekerom, and Kevin van den Broek. I'll put the links to their socials in the description below, and with that being said, enjoy the episode. Welcome to Beyond Coding, a dive into the world of successful people in IT. From your sponsors, Zebia, creating digital leaders. Here's your host, Patrick Akil. People just contacting us. Oh, we, we, we hear you have a new team. And I'm like, yeah, but the, the caveat is we're doing it in Go. Like, yeah. Oh, Go. Yes. <laughs> actually, the two people that joined Hannes' team, I had a lot of contact with, with both of them. And I tried to get them to my team because I knew they were going to switch teams as well. Yeah. But they were like a bit intimidated, I guess, by what we're doing. And then eventually I, they heard that Hannes was building a Go team. We're like, oh, yeah, no, that, that is interesting. <laughs> oh, God. How's, the, how's the kind of internal politics then? Because you obviously you steal a teammate away from someone else, basically. <laughs> Right, so yeah, me and Kevin started as uh, young professionals, which is a good, which is a um, it's kind of a traineeship that Worldcom uh, has. Um, and the idea is that you switch a team after a year. Oh, okay. So, uh, like when you join a team as a young professional, people will know that you will eventually leave already. So, yeah, it's it's taken into account. Nice, nice. And young professional, that's like straight out of university. Or? Yeah, so straight out of university. Okay. Yeah. yeah. You might have like up to two years of experience, I think. Yeah. yeah. So I think you had some experience before as well. Just like uh, no, no professional experience, no. Yeah. Okay. So they're, but they're not called graduate programs or like training. No, it's like nah. That. They try to, it, it kind of is, but yeah. they try to stay away from that terminology, I think. Yeah. No, it's also, also like not, the, the, there's nothing that's being pushed towards you. Like, oh, you have to go on this trip or you have to go to do this. It's like a more of a toolbox you can use. Like, yeah. you can, yeah. I mean, so. it's, it's a difficult one marketing wise, because obviously you have yeah. a lot of traineeships and me personally, initially I was also like, hmm, you know, professional program sounds interesting because yeah. there's benefits, right? However, I just want to be in a team and I want to contribute my part. I don't want to like yeah. feel like an apprentice or something because exactly. I learned yeah. something for a reason. Yeah. Uh, and they did sell me because initially I was like, hey, can we do other stuff? And they were like, nah, you, you should join YP program. <laughs> just like, all right, let's do it. And yeah, okay. it was a good decision. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, the thing I don't like about those traineeships is kind of your growth is kind of static, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. If you grow exponentially, nothing else changes. It's right. just you. And the traineeship is still stuck for like two years. If you want to leave early, you got to pay a lump sum of money because they invested in yeah. you. Yeah. yeah. That's kind of poopy. Yeah, that's it's not the case at Worldcom, I think. That's good. Like they, they try to sell it as like a talent program. And you also see like a lot of the people that are going very fast, they started in the program. Yeah. Yeah, yeah great. And Hannes, you had actually, you had Go experience before you joined Bull.com, right? Yeah, I had a little. Yeah. I uh, did some things on the on the side while I was actually being an engineering manager. Yeah. So my experience was literally, oh, I did some stuff on the side. <laughs> and uh, when I sent my CV to Ball, <laughs> engineering manager and uh, Go developer. Yeah. So yeah. That's how I ended up, yeah. Nice. Uh, and yes, I joined a, a Go team. Okay. So it was also one of the few Go teams at that point that yeah. was in Ball.com. And uh, now, now we got quite a couple of teams actually. What's the what's the team amount like the scale of the operation? In total, I mean, yeah, like how I many? I think teams we are at like 190 teams by now. Yeah, Bolt.com scales. Yeah, Bolt.com yeah. of which guard teams would probably be. I think it's between five and ten. Yeah, around five and ten or so. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So then, how many people in team? Like five on average, or on average, I guess about five. Yeah, yeah. Okay. three to five as developers. Yeah. yeah, of course, other people. As well. That's good. That's yeah, good. yeah. Um, if you look at the things that have been developed, like actual services that, yeah. that run twenty four seven, that's I think five to ten teams, and then. 20, 20 people. Yeah. But if you look at the amount of utilities that have been written and are used throughout the company, like by everybody, then you go up to hundreds of people that use all the systems and applications yeah. and CLIs that have been written. Yeah, that's a lot. And the main the main language is still Java or like a JVM language? Or? JVM, yeah. Yeah. Kotlin okay. is being quite, quite yeah. up to AI. Okay. Be more correct to say JVM because I think Kotlin is could be the predominant one these days. Interesting. Even. Yeah. And yeah. a lot of streaming applications used to be Scala. Mm. But I don't think we really do Scala anymore. Yeah. No. Yeah, it's interesting in Bolt because uh, teams are, can sort of decide what yeah. they use. Scala was there for some point, but it sort of died died down. Mm -hmm. just sort of came, just came and replaced it. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Cool. Kind of the best of both worlds, right? Between like Java and Code. Uh, and then and Scala. So. Yeah. I mean, uh, the recorder's already already started, so I'm just gonna welcome you guys. Welcome, guys. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. We've already been chatting. I need to see where we where we actually start the episode, <laughs> or we might start it here. Who knows? Uh, but I brought you all together actually 
uh, we came all together to talk about Go uh, and kind of how to introduce or introducing Go into your organization in the first place. Um, but let's start with why Go and why, why would someone introduce Go as a programming language within their organization? What problem would Go solve that other languages don't? I'm just going to throw in the middle. Where wants to pick it up, go for it. <laughs> yeah, I guess there's a, I mean, this is a couple of angles you could look this from. Yeah. One would be, would be, be just different people. So I think Go comes with quite a different sort of view on things. Mm. Uh, a lot of simplicity in the community, a lot of, you know, you won't, f you, you'll find the, the thought leaders there like Rob Pike and so really amping on, on simplicity. So you'll, you'll find the language itself be, be very sim simple. Yeah. And a, a lot of people might frown on that and say, Go, but Go doesn't have exceptions and Go doesn't have, you know, generics. Well, yeah. now, oh, now, now we do, but, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, uh, but then I think you missed the point because, you know, it's all about simplicity and, and, and that. Um, there's the thing of, of scale, I guess. Mm. So, uh, and development process scale, perhaps, because Go was invented, I guess, in, in Google to replace their slow building C++ systems. Yeah. And uh, as Rob Pike would say, you know, you could say Go was invented uh, while watching, uh, you know, a build, build run. Yeah. And uh, so for <laughs> us, I think that's a big part for me is uh, how fast it builds and runs. Yeah. And, and runs in your, your CI pipeline. Yeah. So really yeah. speed and, and simplicity. When you say simplicity, is it then on the opposite side elegant? And is it then opinion based what simple is and what elegant is? Because those are kind of vague. I think simple as in um, it fits in your head, mm. a bit more like C, but also um, not not a lot of abstractions. So yeah. language itself, for instance, doesn't have implementation inheritance, yeah. only interface inheritance, uh, which people will also frown, frown on. <laughs> yeah. uh, you know, a lot of people overuse uh, inheritance as well. Mm. But I think that's part of the power of Go. You can sort of read the code and, and understand and you can throw it at young developers, I guess, yeah. inexperienced ones, and uh, it should be okay. Uh, whereas a complex language like Scala, you'll be in trouble if you do that. Yeah. So yeah, simplicity from a just, uh, I mean, if, if I think from an engineering manager's perspective, and I want healthy teams, Go is a, is a good starting point, I think. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's interesting when you said simple, because I guess, one of the things that's also really important within Go is the um, you prepare for the reader over the writer. Yeah. So while writing code, you might write more code. It might take a bit longer, but that does come with the benefit that the reader has a better time or easier time to just go over it, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I love reading Go code if it's clean, right? <laughs> I, I hear a lot of people saying on oh, Go, you can only do it one way. I don't think that's true. You can still do a, a lot of nasty stuff. Yeah. Uh, but a good readable Go code is just easy to browse through. You see what happens. Um, compared to other languages, I, f I felt like, I mean, Jose, how it, you came from Kotlin and right. Kevin always says you're more of a fan of Kotlin back in the day. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm still a fan of like the, I guess the whole little streaming API that you have and the, yeah. the readability, I guess, of the code. But then I, I think now that I've been doing Go for one and a half year, I, I don't think the readability is, is as good anymore because I feel like Go code reads nicer. Yeah. It's, it's simpler. And th what you said that, that there is like one way to do it. I guess there is one best way, but is that a bad thing? You know, like yeah. at least everybody writes it in the same way. So it's, it's yeah. readable. What I also really like is the, uh, why, why, how do, how I sell it to other people is like the, the synergy with our systems because mm. we're doing a big on-prem to cloud migration at Bolt.com. Yeah. And everything is running on uh, 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 Docker, Kubernetes, Prometheus, all these things that are written in Go, Istio, so all those those client libraries that you use are like natively written in Go, and it just it just works so nice together, you know. Yeah, that's uh, and also the startup times are nice. Yeah, <laughs> compared to like a Spring Boot application. Yeah, so those usually uh, get people excited enough to at least try it. Yeah, so really just the the external libraries that you would use are right. already written in Go as well. Yeah. So the and also the standard library has a, had a lot of stuff that you would lose uh, would use libraries for in different things yeah. like JSON parsing. Exactly. HTTP servers, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, hopefully throughout the years, that's kind of the promise, right? That Go, yeah. you also use it if you want software that is healthy over a longer period of time. So, yeah. uh, and they promise that backwards compatibility yeah. yep. in the in the standard library there as well. Yeah, that's it, also actually one of the things that's listed on our Why Go page in, in Ball. Yeah. Is uh, if you don't want to have those breaking changes so often. Yeah. Because of the backward compatibility promise. I, 
you know, that you're not going to upgrade to the next big spring framework release and have lots of breaking changes, uh, yeah. which really saves a lot of time, I think. Yeah, yeah I can imagine so. I mean, I, because ahead, also one of the important things with this backwards compatibility promise is that even though it's backwards compatible, so you won't get any breaking changes, which, mm. which might be better, right? You might change an API for the better after experience of, of having the old, use the old API. You also have a lot of imp performance improvements yeah. because obviously Go is, is what, 10 years old, 11 years old. So yeah. they might not have the most advanced garbage collector or they might not have the most advanced escape analysis, Yeah, but those things are being improved on continuously. So we have seen within the organization after every a major release like 1.15, 1.16, 1.17, that we have 20% CPU improvement, 20% memory usage improvement. Yeah. And the only thing you did was you recompiled it. Yeah. And it was compiled in yeah. three seconds. So you redeployed it, right? You swapped the binary. <laughs> yeah. And suddenly your cost dropped. Instant it's insane. Gain, yes. Yeah. yeah. That makes sense. I mean, so you guys are all from bold.com. I don't think we've given an introduction. So for the audience that is oh, yeah. maybe outside of Holland, uh, who wants to give an introduction in what, what bold.com does? Close. Oh yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Kevin points at you. Yes. Uh, so Bold.com uh, used to be a big web shop and we are moving towards being a big retail tech platform. Yeah. Um, I guess from outside the analysis, you could compare it to something like uh, uh, what Amazon does, yeah. um, but locally okay. in the Netherlands, Belgium and the French part of Belgium. Yeah. yeah. And if we talk about the scale of the operations? Uh, just over a hundred million products. I think yeah. about 50 million partners now that, that sell products on our platform. 50,000, yeah. 50,000, what 50, did I say? 50, 50 million. million. Oh, 50,000, sorry. That's 50 million. Every two products has got a partner. Okay, 50, it's not that much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are working with just over a thousand engineers now, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think those are the important numbers. Yeah. I, I love the stats in, in yeah. synopsis that way. <laughs> yeah. I get that. And at Bouldercom, you, you told me before the show, you have about five teams working on Go as well. Uh, like yeah. That. Yeah. It's been scaling up over the past years, yeah. uh, but now we're about five. And also uh, the, the the biggest part of our uh, landscape, like the, the, the web shop part, they are slowly uh, adopting as well in a new layer. Yeah. So it's getting some more. Uh, and are they, are they adopting it also because of the simplicity and kind of synergy with the applications that you're using? Uh, I, I think that's the reason I haven't really spoken to them. Yeah. So um, if you look at the web shop part where they're trying to introduce Go, it's um, they're basically rewriting it in a big way with yeah. the, the simple shop where they will use GraphQL predominantly. And you can imagine, right, at the scale that we're at, we'll have a lot of services that are either a bit more legacy that don't don't have a lot of uh, improvements or innovation anymore, yeah. but they still need to be uh, in this GraphQL API. Yeah. So what they're trying to do is to have a sort of an adapter in front of those systems that aren't able to include the GraphQL server natively in it. And this is where Go makes it quite easy. Right? You have a simple binary. Uh, it does not use a lot of resources, and it's straightforward to develop over yet another complete application that's over it. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Did you all, so I started with Go as kind of my first programming language more in the adult workspace. I did some PHP and some Python at university, uh, but Go is re really where I started. Okay. First GitHub, you work on the back end, this is in Go, okay, you push it, all that jazz was in Go, kind of the basics. Right. Uh, and for me, it was, it was pretty simple to pick up because there's not a lot of complexity there, right? Uh, I can only do so much. And then Go routines, for example, and channels, uh, I just pushed that back. So I got the basics down <laughs> first and then you actually dive into those were kind of the only advanced topics there. I mean, testing, but testing is, is fairly easy once you get the hang of it as well. Now you have generics and more fuzzy testing, stuff like that. Uh, but for me, it was very simple to pick up, very simple to understand right. what yep. other people are actually doing um, and actually focus on solving the problems, right? right? Because the technical tools that we choose, even the programming languages, they all should solve the problem. That's why I think it's interesting you say elegance versus simplicity, because elegance to me is very opinionated. What is elegant for you might be elegant or not elegant for exactly. you. Exactly. And I think that's also <laughs> what Go in a way solved is, all, you know, you know, our developers can sometimes, you know, go on and on about, should I just put the bracket here? <laughs> you know, is this really elegant, elegant or this? And yeah. uh, Go came out those days with the uh, Go format. Yeah. And it just sort of solved that whole thing. Yeah. You just format your code and you don't talk about that. And exactly. you talk about the more important things. Uh, I think the only is, downside we go fumped, which you're talking about, is that nobody loves it, mm. right? Everybody loves it, but nobody loves it because right. it's opinionated. Yeah. That's the beauty, right? You don't have a discussion. You just use go fumped, even if you hate it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's it. Yeah. But then still, so I've, I've been a bit more online since doing this podcast a bit more on Twitter. And for me, that's two camps, right? People that hate go 
don't like it, don't like the error handling, don't like the garbage collection, have a lot of stuff going against it, or people that love it, love the elegance or the simplicity and see the elegance in there. Yeah. Uh, love the readability, maintainability, longevity, stuff like that. There's there's hardly any middle ground. Yep. What do you what do you think would be kind of reasons against go in that yeah, aspect? I think I mean if if I take a typical spring application, yeah. What what I don't like about it is that I have this big framework mm. and I guess I'm a I'm I'm someone that likes to understand what's going on in yeah. the hood. And it's very opaque. And yes, it's easy to to build a prototype, but if you run it in production and something goes wrong, then you really have to understand quite a lot of things. Yeah. And then it becomes complex. So on 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 the first entry it seems very easy. Oh, I can just build this and this and this and it's really easy and I just add this annotation and go you, you really have to go code that. Um, but in the end, the Go program, you understand the other one, you don't yeah. uh, until. So in a, in a way for me, it's just where the complexity lies. You're just moving it from the one side to the other. And I guess, yeah, some people like the more abstracted things, just make it easy for me. Yeah. Other people like, like us perhaps like to suffer for a while. <laughs> you, you understand and you know what's going on. Yeah. And maybe it's also a control issue. I may, might be a control freak a little bit <laughs> in terms of my code. I like to know what's running underneath and what's going on and what do I do if, if something breaks. Yeah. Mm. So, and some people maybe it's just fine with, oh, I trust the developers of this other framework. Yeah. Yeah. So, so when I had about like three years of experience with Spring Boot before I like really understood like what was happening and really started diving more into like internals. Yeah. And with Go, like within a month, I was running my first services in production and feeling completely confident with it and what everything was doing. And it's where just like, yeah, I guess that's a simplicity, but it's, it's like, there is no magic, yeah. if you will. Yeah. Um, I mean, you were also a better engineer because of that hi history in Java, right? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah no, oh, I, I still, <laughs> I still a, like Spring that. a lot. Yeah. It's just that it took me a long time to really understand what was happening. And I guess, yeah, Go didn't have that like learning curve for me, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I think internally you're talking about the notifier servers, right? In, in our team that you wrote. Right. Yeah. 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 So it's still running. Yeah, yeah, it's something we I haven't I've, touched. Yeah. It. That's good. I've been there for uh, in the team for one and a half year. In my first week, I hadn't touched Go before. I wrote the service, and it's still running. <laughs> so we it's only getting really, faster due to the updates. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's only gotten faster because of new uh, new Go versions. But yeah. it's not doing a lot. It's just like receiving a message and spreading it over multiple topics. But yeah, I mean, it doesn't have to do. It lot. doesn't have to do a lot. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. Yeah. I, yeah, I think there's yeah. also an efficiency, efficiency thing here at play. Some people mm. just like more efficient things, I think. Perhaps uh, more prone to premature optimization as well. But yeah. uh, I like the fact that I can run a, a, a Go app and it consumes 20, 20, 20 megabytes of memory. Yeah. Versus if you have to run a, a Java or JVM, you're already in the gigabytes. Yeah. Well, not well, depends. At least for your image size and, and these kind of things. So, I mean, doesn't really matter. But for me, it's just still nice to the yeah. lightweightness of it. I mean, at some point it matters, right? Because you have cloud costs and you pay for what you use. So all of a sudden, if you use more memory, you also end up paying more down the line. Yeah, especially also if, if you have systems like in Ball, we have also a platform team that develops, you know, uh, systems for, for all the teams. Yeah. And if you have a heavy system that adds a little bit for every team, yeah, then, then it really matters because uh, you can save a lot of money, actually. Yeah. If we drill down to one of the language specifics, which for example, it's either error handling, which I see people hate or love, or people say, oh, the garbage collection is garbage, right? <laughs> Rust does it way better. That's usually the comparison is to the fastest one that it has, and that is Rust. You can tweak whatever knot and screw that you want, and then all of a sudden Go looks worse in comparison. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so Rust is an interesting one there because it speaks to some of those things, mm. but it's, I, don't, I think the learning curve of Rust is really tough. I've heard that, yeah. Or, or it takes you, I mean, if you compare Go, you'll be productive probably within a week. Yeah. Whereas uh, with Rust, uh, you fight with a borrow checker for, for <laughs> a couple of months. <laughs> oh no. And if you survive, you know, if your self-esteem survives it, then you, then you start to love Rust. Yeah. Uh, and then it really works for you because it's a really powerful language. And in that sense, Rust is very complex but very efficient again. Yeah. Uh, Is so, that one step extra towards the efficiency? Yeah. yeah so uh, in that way, I wouldn't recommend, for instance, Rust to everyone, except you really, if you really want to have a performance system. Yeah. So there is a use case in Bolt.com, for instance, where 
uh, we write a, we wrote the service in the recommendations uh, system area. Yeah. And uh, the developer there claims 100x improvement in speed for mm. loading some AI models or something. Can't always confirm. But, uh, <laughs> I can imagine that it can be true yeah. because you have no garbage collection and these things. So I think Go in that sense is nice. It's easy to learn. It's more efficient probably for most things uh, in Java. Yeah. But uh, it still has the garbage collector that makes it easier for you. And uh, it's just a nice go-to language, I think. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why. So I, I see more adoption, right? Also, both from developers as well as organizations. But if you lay out the things that, I mean, we just spoke about, if I build a piece of software, what, like five years ago, and it's still running, and it only gets efficient, more efficient by updating it, uh, I don't have any troubles. People can come in a team and be productive within a week, right? No month onboarding just because of the language. Um, only maybe organizational specifics, but those are hard to absolve. Then Go seems like a pretty good choice from an organization standpoint, no? Uh, I think in, in theory, it, it looks very nice. But yeah. if you look at, say, say you've got, for example, within Bull.com, we've got mm. the Alpha Highway. Um, they are working on it heavily to make it event-driven. Yeah. They've asked me, uh, hey, do you want to join? But I... I don't know. I really wanted to go. Uh, a lot of reasons, obviously. Yeah. So I looked at it and I was like, hey, I wanted to go, but I don't think it's a good idea to now introduce Go while we're rewriting a system within that part of the organization because you've got five teams. Yeah. They're all very good in, in the JVM world. So why take that away? Yeah. Uh, you, you still have business value to deliver to the users. Then making a technological choice because you like such a language or you want something from your own gain yeah. might not be so good. But I think that holds to every language. Yeah, I agree. I, I fully agree that that is an issue that every language yeah. has, right? It shouldn't be, oh, I want to use Go. So let's use Go in the existing, <laughs> yeah. like yeah. 30 people that already do that. Yeah, no, then you get like a mishmash of technologies and then you have way too much overhead, right? It's hard to be effective when that yeah. when that overhead is there. The funny thing is though, that within that side of the organization, Go still popped up. Yeah. So I've been talking to a couple of those engineers and they said, hey, uh, we had to write a load testing tool. Mm. It, it just had to do some load testing. So we wrote it in Go. Yeah. And while we're at it, we also wrote it in Java to compare. Okay. <laughs> so yeah. Go still slips in, even though I wasn't there trying to push it. Yeah. Uh, it still happened. Did, just, did you see go people win, talking. Did Go win the contest there? Um, I think it depends on what you see as winning. So <laughs> they both achieved the same output because it was about publishing messages to a topic. Yeah. But... Right. If, if the one is being built in a day and the other one is built in two days and they have the same output, which one wins? Yeah. If the one uses 200 megabytes of RAM and the other one 100, which one wins? I think it's it's difficult to compare them back to fact. Yeah. Yeah. I think because a lot of systems are already, let's say, let's give the JVM example. If a lot of systems are already built in JVM languages, companies will still hire for JVM developers. Yeah, for right? sure. Yeah. So then how do you, even as a new programming language, how do you fit in between? Is it kind of... Uh, by solving those isolated problems a, a bit differently and then comparing it and maybe making that extra step and implementing it in a different language, I guess. I think if you really want to make a point, mm. you'd have to compare apples to apples. So yeah, that right. will be completely rewriting one application and then finding the axes that you want to compare them to. Yeah. Um, I think if you look at Bold.com, the way it started to manifest itself is with the smaller things, right? We have uh, systems that run in the cloud and on-prem and we need to access those from our machines. So... Yeah. Of course, you have user authentication. People didn't want to constantly copy their tokens and put them into their headers, so somebody wrote a script. They call it Proxer. Um, the guy left. I'm now the maintainer of it with, uh, <laughs> with another engineer, Thomas. But everybody uses Proxer. Nobody knows it's Go, but everybody uses it, and it works. Yeah. Right? It's simple to distribute. It's on a homebrew and everything. So that way, it goes into the organization. Yeah. And then somebody sees it. They want to contribute. Hey, it's in Go. And then it takes yeah. another. It takes life on its own, and, and more tools pop up. Yeah, yeah, but then it, it'll never be fast, right? It's that's a very slow burn of kind of uh, yeah, more definitely and more people excited. Yeah, yeah. So I don't. I also don't think if you look at the way Go has been going in Apple to come, yeah. it has been going slow in the beginning. Mm. But as more people come and more people see, and, and you get certain people that are really into talking about it, because of course you need the right people for that. Yeah, it, it really goes like sky high. Yeah. We've seen we've seen quite a bit of momentum yeah. change in the recent couple of months. Could also be well, would also be because we we started an initiative called Torque, mm. which is then we don't want to call it a framework, but it's it's a toolkit in, in Go. <laughs> yeah, we want want to tread towards the light lightweightness yeah. side more, uh, but that helps people to 
to bootstrap uh, getting a service up. Because okay. I mean, even with Go and its simplicity, it takes it still takes quite a couple of days to get a service in the cloud, right? There's yeah. a, kind of, a lot of stuff that you have to bootstrap that's not really interesting. Maybe it's interesting the first time, but after that, you know, it's just work. Yeah. Um, so uh, Torque's aim is to get people in the cloud quickly and they don't want to think too much about how, how do you set it up. Um, I just want to run my service and then build the business logic. So I think that also added a lot of momentum. Mm. Um, and I wanted to say that, uh, with, with Proxer is, is of course also a very uh, example of where Go shines because Proxer is a Go online tool. Yeah. And Go, the nice thing about Go is it compiles to, to a static binary, right? Yeah. Everything is included, no, no external C library. Um, so it's really simple to deploy. You can literally just send someone the file and they just run the tool. Yeah. Uh, so I think if we're talking about why go in an organization, if you're going to write come online tools to make developers lives easier, it must be in go, I think. Yeah. Um, you could say, yes, you can also write it in, in rust, but even, even that with rust is not as easy because yes, you can compile with a muzzle C library and then you also have a static library, but then you have to go do all that work yeah. with Go is just default and it can cross compiles um, to to a number of platforms, all the ones that you would expect. And it's just really easy. Yeah, I think also the cross compilation and the ease of cross compilation is one of the, ben the, bon the benefits because we recently started adopting the new ARM based MacBooks of Polycom mm. and I got a hold of one. So then I started to compile our code and services that worked. But when I started to compile it and put it on Kubernetes, which runs on a different uh, architecture it didn't and yeah. the only thing i had to do was change an environment variable <laughs> then it worked <laughs> yeah, nice. we like the funny thing is is that everything was already prepared in the systems that we used because it's the go arch environment variable yeah but it didn't work so i was super confused i was like hey we've set up this cross compilation i've got a different architecture why is it not cross compiling yeah apparently there has always been a bug for the past two years because instead of go arch it was garch right the, the whole was missing <laughs> and i looked at our code base the one that Coast and i are currently working in and fixed it that solved it but then i looked at the code base where i came from so yeah. mirage because the engineer that started coast's team came from mirage the same bug, right? It has been <laughs> there for years. Oh, that's it's just yeah. the same make file with copy over. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that always slips in, right? But to be able to uh, deploy your code anywhere and it just runs, right? Even by as simple as changing an environment variable, that is very powerful because I see organizations for some reason, I still don't know why, switching from one cloud provider to the other. Getting to that first cloud provider is already a task in and of itself, right? And then they decide to switch to a different one. And I'm like, man, uh, Microsoft must have paid them like a lot of money. <laughs> to make that but, like there's a good, there's a good deal there somewhere. Um, but then if you are running on go, right. Where you can just deploy it to a different cloud environment, that seems like a big plus to me as well. Yeah. I mean, the, the simplest thing I've seen, which is very powerful, the, the one we're using at my current project, uh, we're running on Google cloud and we have a cloud function, which is just an isolated piece of software that runs. Um, and it's an image resizer. So whenever we have a new image, it picks up that image and it splits it up and it, you have 10 different sizes, right? Which is very nice if you have a mobile view tablet, what, what have you. Um, if you look at the piece of code, it is not a lot, but it actually does a lot of stuff, right? Because image resizing, I mean, if you figure it out, it's easy, but from the sound of it, it doesn't sound that easy. Uh, yet that clown function has been running. Uh, we only update it exactly like your guys' stuff. Uh, and that's it, right? You, you don't even have to look or think about it anymore. It just runs, uh, solve the a memory leak, uh, because one of the writers wasn't closed. One of the readers wasn't closed, but that was the only thing. The classic. Exactly. And then it runs again. Uh, but even what you say, Hannes, in our current project, we have kind of a framework, it's open source, but you can use an annotation and you would spin up lots of the boilerplate that goes into an HTTP service, uh, that will be generated for you. That is the only thing where I'm like, okay, that is kind of boilerplate and that, that might be repetitive, right? Because that part is quite verbose and would be verbose over multiple services. Yeah. So maybe that's kind of the, the boilerplate, more of the verboseness that people are yeah. complaining about. Yeah. But then again, you do see what happens when you actually, when you write that yourself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I guess that's the thing about Go is the verboseness. Yeah. It also bothers me in some sense, but yeah, I have to make peace with <laughs> it's there in front of my eyes. Yeah, it's a compromise, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. It actually helps me throw code away as well. Mm. Because you you you, you, know, you duplicate you, um, you write a lot of duplicate stuff sometimes, yeah. but it's also like because everything is so verbose, I feel happy when I can throw files away. You know, yeah. 
it's uh, it interesting you enough so you to, to go do go go and clean up basically yeah yeah, yeah. it's like a fun task in itself which actually with generics will become less again i guess <laughs> because there will be less duplication yeah that's the i mean so i've had new people or people that are new within go right and then we write a function that is like 95 percent is the same uh except for some variables some, yeah. some specifics and they're like man in java this would be the same, right? We would have one function for two different use cases. And I'm like, but they're inherently different, right? This might be a bit more code. They are actually different. I think generics are, are probably gonna solve part of that if people are trying to use them for that. Um, but yeah, that's usually the, the struggle I have where I think something is simple, right? Two use cases, it's very specified which, is, which use case you're using. Um, it's easy to follow that way as well. It is more code, right? It's always going to be more code because obviously you have two use cases. 95% is going to be the same. And from the other standpoint, it is more code. Therefore, it is kind of worse because this could have been solved simpler, more elegant, less code, less maintainability. That's usually the word I heard. And I'm like, but they're inherently different, right? Yeah. So that argument, I don't think you can resolve that. Yeah, I think there's an interesting one because, I mean, there's the dry principle, right? Yeah. Don't repeat yourself. Yeah. And... Uh, I think it's maybe overvalued or something because, uh, I mean, that's true as long as you're not addressing separate concerns, right? Yeah. If you address separate concerns and you use the drive principle to say, but uh, it must be the same piece of code just because it sort of looks, looks the same, then what you're really doing is you're tying two systems together that's going to break together if you make, uh, make a change. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I guess that's also where Go leans a bit more towards the Unix, Unix philosophy of code generation rather than, you know, abstraction, solving everything through abstraction. Yeah. So it is a different way of solving it, I guess. So that's also where I guess it's a bit of a different mindset or a different yeah. way of doing things. Yeah, I agree. It's either a barrier or or people flock to it. So. Yeah, I think dry dogmatic is, is bad, basically. If I still have two functions and they're complete opposite size of the code base, I would keep those as separate functions instead of introducing like a util that solves both. Exactly. And then people are like, but I, I wrote it like the third or fourth time now. I'm like, maybe now it's a bit more valid, but before that, right. like uh, you wouldn't really do that. Yeah, right. it's, it's figuring out the abstractions right after you wrote them, not yeah. like introduce them straight away. Exactly, yeah. right. I think go leans towards more or less premature optimization in that way as well. Uh, at least from an engineering mindset, that's what I feel like. Can be difficult. I mean. <laughs> it's always going to be difficult. Yeah. It doesn't. So I don't think it's a silver bullet, right? I don't think we're going to have a silver bullet. There's always going to be trade-offs. People are very opinionated, especially in this, in this programming <laughs> space we're in. Um, so there's always going to be trade-offs. That having said, I've done Kotlin, I've done uh, Node on the back end as well, I've done Go. I'm very fond of the kind of simplicity and getting very productive real quick. Right. If I switch a team, I don't know how often you guys switch teams, but if you switch a team and they still do go, you're probably up and running within a few days. Yeah, and yeah. like at Ball.com as well, because we've got so little teams, they look at each other's code bases. Yeah. So most code bases look the same. <laughs> and uh, the way we're now introducing Torque, like Hannes already said, it improves that as well. Yeah. So um, we create small helper functions sometimes or bigger things. So the integration of platform, I guess, is one of the most important parts that we cater for, right? Yeah. So getting yep. a logger within the Bolletcom ecosystem, you need to connect to the correct services and APIs to get that all hooked up. Yeah. Uh, logger, metrics, uh, all that kind of things. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah, makes sense. What do you guys take on, uh, on generics? I mean, it's now, it's end of March. It's been here for maybe like a week or two. Have you guys played around with it? Played around with it. When I when I switched to Go as a programming language in the beginning, I was like, oh, I miss it a lot. And now yeah. I, I don't know. I don't really feel like I need it. <laughs> so I played around with it a little bit. I tried to, we have a, our own set implementation. Yeah. Uh, in our code base. And I tried to make that more generic because now it only works on strings. But then I was finished and I was like, yeah, we actually only really use it for strings anyway. <laughs> so I <laughs> kind of threw it away again. And that's yeah, I think maybe we have a lot of uh, uh, subscribers coming in. Yeah. Well, like, f I think 50 by now, like subscribers of, of different subscriptions coming in. And uh, I think there we might have some win. But then again, it's already with the interface that we created for it. It's already, it feels pretty generic. Yeah. Already. So, I don't know. I missed them when I joined Go and now I don't really need them. Now that we have them, I guess. 
Yeah, I guess you develop also ways around them. Yeah. yeah. But I mean, I, I would go very soon and replace some of the, at into you know all the interface uh, um, declarations everywhere that yeah. you use because you don't have uh, generics. Uh, yeah. Those would be good right. places to start using generics. Where you have like multiple functions suffixed with the name of the variable or like the like yeah, sort in sort string that kind pass of in the interface and then you would uh, you know infer the type in right right yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Type, then do this and you know old school generics yeah, right yeah, yeah. the <laughs> interface yeah. with switch statement yeah everybody's parent <laughs> what what I did like about not having it is you think twice when if 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 if, if you had it you would just use generics right yeah now it forced you to think oh but in what other ways can I solve this problem uh, yeah which which is always good I think yeah, exactly I think we've already solved a lot of problems by not having it exactly as you said. So that's why I'm, I'm thinking of a use case where I really would use it. I mean, we have very narrowly, we have some interface implementations, right? Where you pass a, a variable and the type is an interface, but we already don't like that basically, at least within our team, we, we stray away from that and we duplicate rather than solving it that way. Uh, so that would be one case, I guess, but I mean, you can already do, you can already be effective, right? The language has already come up until this point. Yep. Um, yet it still has generics implementation. Yeah, but, but if you look at it, right? So besides, like I'm very hyped by generics because mm. it is, of course, very valuable to have in a in a bigger language. Yeah. The way they went about it is just fascinating to me because mm. it's not like generics was built in a year. It's not like two years. I think it was, it was already five years it took, in a running. It took a while, yeah. Yeah, but... Along the whole path, they've made multiple proposals. The whole community is involved in those proposals, right? They either yeah. reject it or they have ideas about it. But the creator of, I think, at least one of the main creators of the JVM generics contributed to the Go generics. Mm. And they wrote their own program to validate generics working Go. I think it was Federweight or something like that. Okay. Like the whole idea that you create another language to prove generics works in this language <laughs> is backwards compatible because they first wanted to do it in go to the dough. So we'll break everything that already existed. Yeah. That, it's just fascinating. I mean, yeah. Yeah. from an engineering point, when we develop code within our organization, you only have such a blast radius within the organization. Yeah. If you do it just, just globally, like, I mean, yeah. like, like on the even it's, it's a, it's pretty good of an achievement. It's amazing. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it's really taking that promise of backwards compatibility and really taking that step extra, yeah. right? Really just resolving those developer issues because those issues, if they arise within a language, those are developer issues, basically. They're not necessarily organizational issues. The organization benefits from those upgrades, sure. Uh, but those are real technical issues for developers to, to resolve, right? If you say to your product owner, listen, uh, we haven't done any updates, so this sprint is only gonna be updates and we expect we need to rewrite some code. They'd be like, what the heck? Why, first of all, why haven't we done the other things? And why would it take long to rewrite a lot of stuff, right? That just sucks. Yeah. So if you don't have that and, and can really just focus on delivering value, because that I think that is still at least what my main driver is, or one of them, is delivering value for whatever I'm doing. Yeah. Um, it'd be awesome if that's not there. And I haven't, I don't think I've, maybe with libraries that I've had to, to make changes, uh, right. but within the standard library, I haven't, I haven't uh, had such an experience basically. But it of course also comes with the downside that it, it might take longer for the libraries to emerge. Yeah. If you look at now, generics got released. Uh, yeah. There's still problems with generics, right? They're trying to, trying to address those in, in 1.19, the next update. I think one of the biggest ones is the compilation speed. Yeah. One of the key points for Go is having fast compilation speeds. Our code base is like up to 100,000 lines of code, take a couple seconds to compile. Yeah. With Go 1.18, which has the generics, it does take 30% longer, like yeah. the time did. Is it bad? No, because four seconds still doesn't really break the bank, but it is something and they still want to improve it. Yeah. And if you look at the code side of things, generics of course are very useful for uh, collections. Go always had a, a map with interfaces. So you do have the option to use it with every type you have in the code base, but it's not static. Sure. The packages that they're creating for slices and maps, they're in the experimental level of the standard library. So you can use them now, but they're bound to change because they first want to figure out what works for the developers on the other side of the building, right? So yeah. outside of Google, <laughs> um, that's interesting. And yeah. you can you can look all of these things up in GitHub and just comment about it and learn from it. Yeah. So that's what I mostly do. I just follow these proposals, try to read what they're doing. And it's interesting, yeah. especially because sometimes it doesn't have stuff like memory arenas, something that was recently uh, brought up. It's just interesting to read what they're doing because 
they're very in depth because they're forced to because it's all public, right? Yeah. yeah. Exactly. And not every developer has to deal with it, right? Oh. They are creating language. They probably deal with these very niche kind of topics. But it's awesome that, I mean, from an outside point of view, you can really just take a look inside the kitchen, right? Uh, see what everyone's cooking up, see what everyone's kind of monstrosity they're creating or discussing <laughs> even. Uh, and what might end up on your plate might be beautiful, but you can actually see how it happened, yep. uh, which is great. I think, uh, do a lot of programming languages have that as well? I, I don't know, actually. Well, the JVM, of course, has the JEPS, the yeah. Java enhancement proposals. Those are also quite nice and quite extensive. I've heard that. Rust yeah. also have, have a very open... Which one? Uh, Rust also. Yeah. Is the Rust compiler open source? Yeah. Mm. That's dope. I think in general, yeah. that's just really cool. Yeah. That it's uh, all the information's out there. Nothing's behind closed doors. Yeah. Uh, almost but nothing. There's probably some. What, what I again, what again, I like about the Go process here is just how new features. You know, there's not, there's no sugar rush. There's not. Mm. Oh, let's just add the next feature. And right. uh, and that's also why you might hate it or or love it. But I really respect that that mm. um, the leaders of of that community can say no. Let's wait off. Let's wait off. Let's figure it out properly. Yeah. Let's do high quality implementation. No, we don't need it yet. You know. And I think it's really tough to actually do that uh, for them, probably. Yeah. Uh, but I, I, I quite respect that. And then again, in the end, you, you, you have the less is more, uh, you know, thing. Yeah. But it does impact the users. I mean, if you look, if you look at Go when I started, I think it was like what, five, five years ago, seven years ago, something like that. Mm. And you looked at dependency management. It's like, yeah, just use Deb or what are the other ones, or, right? It's <laughs> yeah. like, all right, so. Apparently the standard library didn't have dependency management back then. Yeah. So the community built multiple versions of dependency management. Yeah. And then one was, I guess, a bit more victorious. And then they went into the standard library, look at Go modules, which was, I guess, a combination of all of these experiences. And yeah. it does have benefits. Yeah. Yeah. The other one, I guess, is Go Embed, which we have now. But before oh, that, no it was Go Rice and there was like a multitude of them. Yeah, exactly. I'm glad they uh, they kind of resolved that. Oh, like no. Go yeah. Embed is also interesting to just to take a deeper dive into. I mean, the promise of having one binary that you distribute, that's going to be an issue, right? If you have uh, additional files, you want to include HTML files or something. Go Embed does make it nice where you just say Go Embed, which is just one of the directives from the Go compiler and the Go language itself, and it embeds it into the binary. And Yeah. 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 If, we look at, if we look at hiring, so if... I would introduce a new a new language within an organization. Well, the question is going to be hiring, right? Uh, if no one can maintain whatever my team or me, uh, whatever we're writing, uh, then it's kind of useless, right? Because then you have a huge dependency on the people that you have. Um, therefore, the languages that we use, we should also be able to hire for, basically. Yep. I really love that we stated um, that Go is easy to learn. Uh, would you also hire someone that doesn't have Go skills necessarily but obviously it's open to learn it yeah i would definitely do that and <coughs> i have done that in the past yeah in my engineering manager capacity in fact at that stage i was working for a company in south africa called intersect and we were hiring java developers but i went went and looked for c plus plus developers that would do java yeah because you know that they think more of efficiency and the lower level things and at some point we also switched to to go in that environment yeah so I, I th I think, I mean, for 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 engineering managers, I think we need to think a little bit differently there. Yeah. Because we we tend to hire Java developers for a Java role, but we should hire good engineers, right? Yeah. We should find good engineers and ask them what they want to do, and we should make sure that we don't introduce languages that are going to be deprecated in five years from now, <laughs> <laughs> or that no one will pay for. Yes. Yeah. Then developers will also leave. But I mean, you're quite safe with something that's sim simple to learn and that is supported by someone like Google. Um, you can have uh, developers in the future. So yeah. I think there's a culture thing also at play because I have also heard that, you know, people don't want to do Go. We have good engineers, but they don't want to do Go. They want to stick to the to to their technology, which is fair, right? I mean, yeah. which which could also be fair. Yeah. But maybe if 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 you if you're gonna have you know a couple of languages in your organization, maybe you should think of that upfront and get more more at least a quorum of people that would be willing to switch quite easily. Yeah. yeah and exactly. there are definitely those people. Yeah, I think that a lot of the the techniques or the the practices that you learn within a certain language 
hopefully they're transferable, right? Most of the time they are, uh, unless it's very specific for a uh, for language there. Yeah. Uh, but I like that from a hiring perspe perspective, you just hire good engineers, right? <laughs> whatever language they should use, whatever tool they pick up from their toolbox shouldn't necessarily yeah. matter. Uh, or they can learn, for example, how to use a drill. Uh, I mean, <laughs> exactly. taught yourself something as well. Yeah. yeah. I think that that's also important because we also tend to speak of, oh, this is a Go team and this is perhaps a Kotlin team. But yeah. I think that kind of thinking is perhaps also wrong. Yeah. Mm. Because in your problem space, you you should look at the problem and say, okay, JVM is just the best for this. There's a big ecosystem for this. Uh, it's already solved 10,000 times. Let's just use it, right? Yeah. But then you might also have this service that's really simple. It's going to just do nothing. Just use Go because it's going to be a low memory footprint and it's not going to cost a lot. Or there might be the efficiency one that you really have to push it and then you should use Rust or something. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you don't want 20 languages in the same team, but I think you should at least have a sort of, you know, uh, a language, a go-to language for, for certain kind of things. Do you want efficiency? Do you want compatibility? Or, you know, what do you want? Uh, so you yeah. For me, it was also like a big moment of clarity at the time that I was looking for a new team that I don't, I, I think even you, you brought it up, but like, do I want to profile myself as a JVM engineer or as a software engineer? Yeah. yeah. And when I started thinking about it like that, I was like, yeah, maybe, you know. Was that the well, convincing argument? Yeah, yeah. That, 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 <laughs> I had that, a I think, whole repertoire of arguments. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I think that was, for me, when I really started thinking about that question, I was like, yeah, yeah. I, I don't think I'm a JVM engineer, you know, I'm, yeah. I think I'm a software engineer. Um, and apparently this problem is going to be solved with Go. So yeah, let's do it. I wanted to solve the problem as well. Exactly. I was still doing it. Yeah. So. I mean, even if you take a step beyond that, right, you already have positions like front end engineer, back end right. engineer, very technology focused yeah. within back end, you have JVM, Go, what, what have yeah. you. Um, I think it's more centralizing towards just good engineer, good engineering culture, good engineering mindset, being able to pick up a tool and uh, teach yourself how to use it or be able to resolve it within a team. Right, because I'm better at certain stuff, you're better at certain stuff. Yep. We should just be able to figure it out. Um, and I think if if we make a switch within hiring, the mindset will also change within either teams uh, or the people that are applying. Yep. That's what I'm hoping at least. Because uh, it's just, it's sad to be labeled or categorized within a certain technology. Exactly, yeah. Right? yeah. yeah. You wouldn't want that to have like an Excel analyst or a, <laughs> I don't even know what other stuff you have. I'm a raw YAML engineer anyway now. <laughs> yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Well, well, it's YAML engineering, isn't it? Yeah, so it's a bit broader than that. Yeah. But I completely agree with that. That's, uh, that's hard. So it's a nice bridge, right? To what are the downsides and benefits of introducing Go to your organization? Yeah. I mean, if you look at hiring, um, I do one of the parts of hiring with Go, you do one of it. And I think we have one other engineer. Yeah. That means we have tr three Go engineers that hire for the Go community. Yeah. Uh, I see Hannes a lot when we're looking for team members. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Can be busy. Yes. Yes. Because so you're, <laughs> you're the only one as a Go engineer that is quote unquote capable of doing these, these hiring procedures with yeah. the Go language. So yeah, that, that does have strain as well. Like if you only have three people, you can only do so many interviews a week. Yeah. So it will have some time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you're always going to trust the person that you're hiring, right? At, as long as, I mean, you can grill them for hours. At some point, you're either going to make a decision. It's going to be a yes yeah. or no. Yeah. And the yes comes with some amount of trust. They can gain more trust by having a longer interview process, more conversation, stuff like that. But at the end, you need, you need to trust their mindset. They need to be able to pick up Go. Either they know it or they don't uh, and run away with it. Yeah. Um, I've also had people that came into my team and they said, after months, actually the language, I really don't like it. I don't feel productive in it. I it's, it's not me. And they couldn't really put it to words. They were missing stuff from a JVM language. They had some Node.js knowledge um, and they went away. They they gained that knowledge that Go is not for them. Uh, too verbose, not elegant. I, I heard that one as well. Um, and they learned from that, which is fine, right? It's not for everyone. I thought it was a shame because I actually hired the guy. <laughs> 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 yeah, so you're always going to have that. And is there, is there anything that's still missing that you guys wanted to address within this kind of conversation? Well, for me, if you, if you look at Ball as well, where, where does Go start? Mm. Um, at Ball come the platform side of things, we already addressed a little bit. That was predominantly uh, Python, yeah. uh, Bash scripts, I guess, and probably a lot more that I don't know because I'm not part of that organization. <laughs> um, but they've been trying to move into uh, the new system, they call it BBA. Yeah. And that requires you to do more within the Kubernetes space. Yeah. And they looked at it, they were writing operators, right? The, the, the part of Kubernetes where you can create your own platform. That has 
very good support to Go. Mostly because Kubernetes is written in Go, all the libraries are prepared for Go. Yeah. Initially, I think they tried with Python and some people wrote it with Java. That works. But they did notice that Go works better. Mm. It's just it's just the little things. And yeah. they are now working with Go, which I think is quite respectable because for all of those engineers it was new, at least for the part, which is doing mostly for BB-8. But you also see that within our community at Bold.com, they reach out like, hey, you guys have done a lot of Go. Can you look at our code? Yeah. Right? Can you help us out? Because we know we're from this background. We would like to see what you guys think of it. And because it's such an approachable language, it's not that it takes months for me to look at their code base and be like, I would have done this differently. Yeah. It just takes, I guess, a weekend or a couple of hours <laughs> to look at smaller parts. Yeah, that's dope. Yeah, I love that you did that. We're still working on it. So <laughs> I'm trying to write my own operator just to get more into the space, but yeah. it, it's cool, yeah. Yeah, guys, uh, I must say I really enjoyed uh, this conversation. Let's uh, let's do it again sometime. Sure. Uh, maybe uh, in a few months, in a year. I mean, we're gonna we're gonna create a lot of content now, actually. Yeah. yeah. Through through our company, so uh, so stay tuned for that. If you're still listening, uh, let us know in the comment section below what you thought of the episode. Have you heard of Go? Have you tried it? Uh, did this talk make you excited? Uh, and with that being said, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks for listening, everyone. If you like the episode and want to support the show, don't forget to leave a rating. Better yet, share the episode with a friend. Let us know in the comment section below what you want to hear and we'll make it happen. Cheers.